Welcome everyone to Popcorn Peeps episode 21. This is the podcast in which we venture through the Hollywood Reporter's top 100 films and give our thoughts along the way. In this episode 21, we will be checking out the 1954 crime drama On the Waterfront, directed by Elia Kazan, starring Marlon Brando, Carl Malden, Lee Cobb, and Ava Marie Saint. This film won eight Academy Awards and was also entered into the U.S. National Film Registry. However, without further ado, I am joined by the bum, Craig Moore. Hey! The bum, Chris McMullen. I prefer unhoused. And the bum, Sarah Alexander. Hey, Jordan. You're all a bunch of bums. What did you think of this film? We could have been contenders. But we're just bums. I loved it. What? This was a great movie for me. I thought the package was nice and tight. All of the writing was dead on. The acting was amazing. I'm not even a religious person by any means, but Carl Malden's speech on the docks just before he's raised up, ugh, the performances were amazing. This was a great movie. The priest nailed it. His speech, so good. We'll get into it later, but how about you, Craig? Hold on a second. First of all, I would like to hear the counterpoint. I would like to hear Chris's counterpoint. It sounds like he has a counterpoint. I did not enjoy it even a little bit. This like legitimately belongs on the top 100 films of all time. Oh my God. I actually fell asleep and had to run it back. It was so awful. This is the man who gave Amadeus gold stars, falling asleep on on the waterfront. Come on, man. Oh, the acting was just so bad. Okay, I'll, I'll give it to you. It is a little bit overacted. However, that is very common amongst films of this era. And to be honest, I thought it suited the over-the-top kind of story and the vibe really well to kind of overact it a little bit. I thought it sold it. It's a change in acting too, where you do get more realism. It's not as stagey as some of the other movies prior to this time would have been like. This is more gritty. I hear you. Like in the transition between whatever the other thing is called and like the method acting that just seems so much more genuine. Chris, would you go as far to say this is a bad movie? Well, why don't we save that till the end? <laughs> what do you think, Craig? I think Chris has finally lost it. The senile old man is ready to be shipped <laughs> off to the home. Are you crazy? <laughs> this was a great film. Brando killed it. The priest killed it. That old man killed it. I thought the entire cast was amazing. It was a great story about this guy who did something. He didn't even know how in, how deep he was in until it was too late. And then he's got to decide whether to do the right thing or, or the safe thing. And, and that's a choice we all have to make at some point in our lives, whether it's the right decision to do what you know is right or to make the safe call and there's arguments good arguments to be made for either decision like man this was a good film it spoke to me i wasn't sure what type of film i was getting into so in the first scene when teddy says to joey hey i found your missing bird i was just waiting for him to flip him off and then he pulls an actual pigeon out of his coat and i'm like what the fuck is happening i get a lighter a pen but a pigeon imagine you're just walking past this guy on the street and his fucking jacket is trying to take off regardless <laughs> I love this film. And our closest point of comparison is Seven Samurai that also came out in this year. And my God, does On the Waterfront kick that movie's ass from a story perspective, characters, action, tension, narrative. And I think it kicks the ass of a lot of the films we've seen so far. At the beginning, I did think it was a l- maybe a little bit hard to get into, but maybe just because that was because it was black and white. I was having a hard time telling some of the characters apart because a lot of the dress and a lot of the clothing and they're all white dudes. But like once I was in the story, man, I was in. This was great. You guys want to talk about some characters? Do we want to just break it open? Talk about Terry Malloy? Terry Malloy is who I wish Rocky was. Rocky was the film I compared this most to. Not regarding any of the sports, but you had the same underdog story. It just filled him out as a character so much more. He had that soft side, but he was conflicted between his two choices. Brando did such a good job. Rocky is just a carbon copy of Terry. The parallels with the fighting, uh, and I'm going to say this in air quotes, sweetheart, idiot kind of personality. Even so, that the really creepy kissing scene (laughs) was also in this movie. And it was equally as cringy. Yeah. The one thing I will say that rubbed me the wrong way with Terry is that he had a direct hand in the murder of Joey. And even if he didn't know what exactly he was getting into, he was still going to cause that man some hurt. And so the fact that he has the audacity to still try and court the sister Edie just blows my mind. Yeah. Like, why do you think it is okay to bone the sister of the man you just killed? So that made the romance for me really jarring. And so while I really enjoyed the overarching 
overarching story here, I did think the weakest part of the film was probably the root of Edie and Terry's romance. Their entire romance did nothing for me at all. I didn't believe any of it. Felt shoehorned in. And maybe it's just because I don't understand romance stories from that era, but it came off as creepy and forced and gross. Like when. Why was he always putting stuff into her mouth? Yeah, don't do that. Some people are into that, Chris. Don't fetch shame them. <laughs> I don't feel like she consented to that. So when the father was telling her, this is crazy, like you're not getting tied up with the priest and this bomb, you got to get back to school and go do something with your life i was like yeah you don't want to be in a romance with this guy whether he's a sweetheart or not go be a school teacher do something with your life don't get tied up with this doc mob crap go be somebody you know she should have seduced the priest <laughs> that would have been a better story that would have been a way better story. See? Chris, fuck off. Oh my god. Okay, what really sells me on Terry, even though the romance is bad, is that his development as a character is super gradual, which is impressive considering that this is a fairly condensed runtime. And so to have such a seamless transition from, I don't give a shit, I'm looking after me. Why would I get involved? I ain't reaching my neck out for nobody. I ain't singing. To just have his conscience just slowly start to eat away at him until he's completely immobilized by it and he can't can't even think or do anything without just feeling the guilt like that was so well done so this is a classic story that comes up over and over again in cinema it's not new and i don't even think it was new at this point and i know this is a rather old film but this is the story of a woman taming a man and it's it's like simba right like simba was just wasting his life palling around with timon and simba just being <laughs> you know being some punk and then nala came up and he was like oh i better straighten my laces and be a man otherwise she's not going to be interested in me this is a standard story it's it's all through fiction it tells the same story over and over and the story is a thing that happens in real life all the time men only not only but men often straighten up and start getting their lives together when there's more on the table than just themselves. They have a potential with someone they're interested in, and that will be left to waste if they don't do something about it. I will never be put on the straight and narrow. I'm a free spirit until the day I die, Craig. <laughs> cannot tame this. You have a full-time job and you're getting a car. <laughs> I cannot be tamed. Like, what do you want from, like, I don't know. How am I supposed to commit crimes without a getaway vehicle? He wants to go to the bank and get a mortgage. I will not be tied down i'm a free spirit okay buddy you steal the car first jordan jesus Duh. don't use your own car i bought a honda civic on a 2.99 interest so i could go rob a bank <laughs> Speaking of comedic lines, I did like some of Terry's kind of interactions with the film's comedy. Uh, at the beginning, in particular, there's a scene where a gang member comes in with a bunch of earnings and he goes, uh, of course I counted it here. And he, the boss goes, no, I needed to recount. Terry, can go count it. And everyone goes, whoa, 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 I wouldn't trust Terry to count the money. And then he's like, nonsense. And meanwhile, during the scene, Terry's counting it. And then he's like, oh, guys, I lost track. Yeah. And everyone just laughs at him and he just swipes the money away. I thought it was good. Haha, uh -huh. you have brain damage from boxing. <laughs> what about Edie? Do you guys have anything to say about her? I think ultimately she was added in to make Terry more sympathetic, but she didn't do a lot for me. The scene she was in, I was just more interested in Terry. I totally thought she was going to be the Princess Peach of this film, but I don't think that's quite true. Edie, along with Father Pete, are really the driving factors between the degradation of Johnny Friendly's gang and the reason why Terry is a better person. As Craig said, like, she tames Terry, but also it's Edie and it's Pete that are like, no, like, we got to get to the bottom of this. We can't be content with being deaf and dumb. We need to get this meeting to Together. We need to figure out what the root of this issue is. And so I thought she really like had a significant purpose in this film. I feel like there's a lot of female characters who like blanch it up, but she really had a, a core part of this film to play in the narrative. I agree with you. I would have rather seen her as the main character. She drives the plot more than he does. I'm trying to think the thing he does that I can think of is that he saves her when the, the union busters come in, but really it's her and the priests that are doing most of the heavy lifting. You can't quite focus on her entirely because Terry is the one who who has the relation to Friendly and Charlie and whatnot. So she can instigate, but I don't think she has a way of really reaching yeah. out and concluding the story. And so that's where Terry comes in to then develop based on her input and then influence the, the gang activity. Yeah, I agree with you, Chris. She's definitely an A-level character in the film, but she's not the lead. And I don't think she has enough to do in the story to be the lead. I'm going to probably do this a lot through the conversation, but I'm going to compare it to Rocky. And compare 
comparing her to Adrian, there's no comparison, right? She's way more active in the film. She has a lot more to do with how things play out, how the characters react to each other. She puts people in states of jeopardy by the way that she talks to them and convinces them to do things. She actually affects the plot. So Adrian, suck it. You could have been you could have been a contender. <laughs> Well done. I think you could have made Edie a better character if you didn't just make her like infatuated with Terry, but instead changed her motive. So she's playing Terry to try and get information because she knows he's part of the gang or he's at least affiliated with it in some way. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Schmooze him up a little bit so you can kind of get the dirt, but I, they didn't take that angle and I think that was a missed opportunity. I agree. And it also would have subverted a cliche. Cliches only became cliches because films like this made them cliches, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. It wasn't a cliche yet. It was just a story. I think it might have been a cliche already. <laughs> that was probably a cliche in like the Middle Ages when poets were writing shit, to be honest. Poets still write shit, just for the record. <laughs> They're called rappers now. How about Father Pete? What do you guys think of this guy? That was an amazing performance. As I said, that speech when he was down at the docks was so good. I got goosebumps. He did such a good job delivering those lines. I've also seen this actor in another Marlon Brando movie called Streetcar Named Desire, and he also has an amazing performance there. So I think he's just super talented, but not nearly as well known as some of the other big names of the 50s and 60s. Is Streetcar later? It's earlier. It is earlier, because when he yells for Jimmy. Joey. Joey, thank you. It would have been had Stella. Like a, I had a big Stella moment. So I told Scott I was going to be watching this movie with him like two weeks ago and he just kept going Stella because he thought this was the movie that was from. And so I've been listening to him go Stella for like a week every time I walk by him and it wasn't even in the movie. My grandma did the same thing today. I was telling her we were recording and she says, I love that movie, Stella. And I was like, clearly, <laughs> no, you don't. No, it's Joey. Father Pete is actually such a giga chad. This guy does not take no bullshit. This man has seen good people die and he's putting his foot down not only does he walk the walk he talks the talk and sarah you are so right that scene after dugan dies goosebumps and again i'm not a religious person but they just it's just like am i catholic now i don't know <laughs> yes <laughs> i've been converted <laughs> that actor did such a good job playing a priest he converted all four of us <laughs> no he did not <laughs> I did want to say, he got called out in the beginning of the movie, right? One of the people said, you know, priesty, father, you'd know what was going on if you'd step out of your church once in a while and actually, you know, walk around. He got shamed and he took it to heart. And that was his character development was from this priest who just sat in the basement of his church doing his Sunday mass to a guy who orchestrated what was basically like a union uprising and overthrowing the corrupt leadership like it was a really good story for that priest for sure i do have a question for you guys about father pete's immortality why is killing 20 longshoremen totally fine for the mob but they cannot touch pete to save their life it just seems so strange they don't show their aggression in front of him but yet they'll even smash the church windows during the uh the busting of the meeting it just seemed really weird to me like are you not going to go to hell anyway for being a murderer like no, is murdering no. a priest Here's versus murdering 20 people not any different here's how christianity works i'm gonna sum this up for you real quick if you do something really bad and i mean really bad you go to the priest and you say hey father sorry about that man and he's gonna be like it's okay son i absolve you of your sin and you're like nailed it one way ticket to heaven booyah but if you kill a priest, who's going to absolve you of your sins? <laughs> Literally all of the dock workers should have shown up wearing the same outfit as the priest. And they're like, we're members of the church now. You cannot kill us. We are speaking out against you. <laughs> I got a question for you guys. Are you deaf and dumb or would you speak out to your boy Father Pete and help spread the justice? Interesting question. Everyone wants to say that they'd be the ones to st stand up and speak out, right? Everybody wants to say, I wouldn't stand for that, whatever. But the vast majority of people wouldn't. And I honestly, you know, I probably wouldn't either. Especially when it came to the point where, say, my brother's in the mob and he comes to me and says, Hey, Craig, I know things are looking rough, but I'll tell you what, we're going to put you on the payroll and you're going to be making $200 a week, which at that time was a ton of money. And it's like, hmm, that's a lot of money. I guess I'll just keep my mouth shut. Wait, wait, that, that, wait that's not a ton of money right now? Should I be talking to HR? That's more than Jordan makes a week. <laughs> money talks. And in this case, money tells you to shut up. Yeah, I think everyone would tell you that they'll talk until they're in the situation and then they keep their mouth shut. 
I think that's why the background of this movie is so interesting and why I feel like Chris might not like it. When I was googling around, I saw that in 1946, Oddly enough, The Hollywood Reporter published a list of 10 people in Hollywood that were taking part in communist activities, and it just spiraled from there. There was a blacklist, and they called people in to testify and try and dig out these other celebrities who were working in Hollywood because they believed their conduct to be un-American. And 15 or 16 years prior to this movie's release, Elia Kazan was in a communist group. He left, he quit, and became disenfranchised with it. So he was called to testify and he named names. So he did turn. From there, a lot of people lost work for years because the studios would no longer hire them. So he made this movie as a justification for why he talked. I really don't know how comparable the communist groups were to an actual mob who killed people, but that's where the parallel was. I think it was Lee J. Cobb who plays the mob chief also came out and testified because he was one of the people who couldn't find work to feed his family. He had to institutionalize his wife because he had nothing. Like, what do you do? Interesting. So I can say, I think I would inform on the murderers, but I can 100% would not name names in some, some kind of witch hunt. This movie was seen as his justification. He was trying to get people to understand why he named names. I didn't know that we were doing movie review written by some McCarthyist, Red Scare, <laughs> right wing <laughs> propaganda machine. I must have just grokked that from the movie. I could just, just tell it was... That's what I think, Chris. You just knew <laughs> yeah. it. And when it was first being written, they didn't want longshoremen as gang the gang members. They wanted communists because they thought that longshoremen were too unrelatable. But everyone cares about communism. In the end, obviously this idea didn't fly. Well, they used the corrupt union as an allegory for it, which was pretty good. Yeah, it was a great idea because this wasn't uncommon. This wasn't a prima nocta. Like, this was a real thing that happened. And even after this film, there were still corrupt longshore unions being busted after the fact. So to root it in a piece of history is cool. Yeah, there's an article that just came out in March of this year, and it said that they've been looking at salaries of union workers on the docks, and some of them go up as high as 400000 per year if you have the right connections, and they check out who actually is being allotted the work. So it's obvious that it's still a prevalent problem. Wow, that's wild. I did not know that that was a recent issue. I thought that would have been plucked out by now, but... Elia Kazan got a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Oscars in 1999, and it was split 50-50 who stood up and clapped for him and who didn't when he went up to get his award. Because he had named names? Yeah. This is interesting. We're going to maybe spin out. But so the guys who are, what's the, you know, we're deaf and dumb here. They're protecting the criminals versus actually naming people who really aren't doing anything wrong. Yeah, I agree with you, Chris. I was going to say the same thing. I think there's a very big difference between going to the police and saying, hey, I just watched a dude throw another dude off of a building to kill him and going and saying, this guy's a communist, this guy's a communist this guy's a communist, this guy's a communist. Now, being a communist at the time, certainly not something that was socially acceptable, but not a crime, right? The constitution al allows people to be communists if they want to. You're not hurting anybody by being a communist. You're just associating with a group of people and talking about communist ideas. Big difference. Would I name names if somebody came to me and said, do you know any communists? I'd be like, no, fuck off. <laughs> but if someone came to me and said, hey, did you see who killed that guy who lives across the street from me last night? I'd be like, yeah, it was the guy in the red hat who lives in the corner. Go get him. Let me go get you the security footage from my camera. Yeah, he, he killed the guy. I'm glad to see that Craig speaks to the police the same way he speaks to me. Get off my front lawn. No, yeah. you're like, oh, no, go fuck off. In terms of the plot itself, I love crime dramas. And unlike Seven, where we follow the cops, this is kind of cool because we follow kind of the heart of the mob itself, which has me really hyped for Godfather. It's so far away. I'm kind of sad because now I want to go watch it. Uh, I like that cat and mouse dynamic that the film sets up and the mob is just trying to pick apart any part of the resistance, but do it in a way that they can just narrowly avoid the police, just kind of skirting that line, just trying to be as, as subtle and nonchalant and in the shadows as they can. And I also like that it's a win for 
Terry and the workers, but the film doesn't wrap everything up in a nice bow. It essentially shows us the first battle towards dethroning Johnny Friendly, but it still leaves a lot up to interpretation. You still have the first signs of rebellion, but it's not done. He's not in jail. And it lets you imagine where the story could go in a hundred different directions. And it's interesting that it sets up like a hundred different sequel opportunities. There was one interesting point that kind of alluded to how things were going to sum up was when there was that, I don't think we ever saw his face or find out, found out who it was, but it was a rich guy watching a TV sitting there and then the help came over and he said, like, turn that off. And if friendly calls, I'm not in. Yeah, it alludes to like a, a bigger boss. To basically make it sound like he's cut off, he's done, he's lost favor with whoever is in charge, right? So it kind of gives us a hint at how the story might end, but it's also possible he could get off, right? He's a, he's kind of a weasel. He, he knows some people. He can bribe, lie, whatever. So absolutely. Do you guys have any other characters or like main plot points you guys want to discuss? I liked the cop, the lead investigator, who I believe was played by Leif Erikson, who looks great for being over a thousand years old, by the way. (laughs) Did we talk about his brother at all? No, Charlie. I really enjoyed the scene in the back of the car and the dynamic between Charlie and Terry, where there was so much hurt on Marlon Brando's end. That was so powerful to see. And then Charlie realizes like, oh shit, I fucked my brother's life up. What am I doing? And I have a fun fact. The actor that played Charlie, Rod Steiger, was also Victor in Dr. Zhivago. I think if the Father Pete scene isn't the best scene in the movie, this scene in the back of the car is. I think it's so interesting that Charlie is willing to blame the manager. He's just, he's delusional. He's just feeding uh, whatever he can to to Terry to get him to come along. And, that, and at that point, Terry has just had enough and he goes, no, it was you. You're that scumbag that stopped me from reaching my true potential. That I could have been a contender. I could have had class. I could have been something. And the way the line is delivered, it just, it shakes you. Like he's so much passion and to see the pit of despair and disgust that Terry has been thrown into because of his brother's mismanagement of the whole situation and to see him finally lash out and say no I'm not going to take it anymore I'm not going to stand up for your bullshit and your bullshit institution it's awesome super powerful the line is delivered so well that we feel the way that Charlie feels because Charlie's reaction is totally the opposite of what it normally would be right he might tell his brother oh run away punch me or like feed his brother to slaughter but what he actually does is tries to cover for his brother and basically sacrifices himself for his brother most people and i hate to say it but i think most people wouldn't sacrifice themselves for their brother like that and because that line and that moment in the back of the car is delivered so well and it shakes charlie to his core and it shakes us too we don't even question charlie's reaction we go wow he really regrets what he did there's been a lot of great acting on this list so far but this is is one of the most memorable scenes I've seen in the last 21 films. So if I'm Terry all the way along, maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm not going to snitch. Maybe I'm not going to snitch. Maybe I'm not going to snitch. For anybody out there listening, thinks that maybe I know something about them. They don't want me to snitch. Killing my brother is the number one way for me to do whatever I can to destroy him. <laughs> I don't know what Friendly was thinking. He should have just kept Charlie hostage and been like, hey, your brother's with me. Sure would be a shame if something happened to him. That would have made me shut my mouth immediately friendly thought he was gonna kill charlie and then he was gonna kill terry and he was gonna wash his hands of the blood and go on his business that's what he thought yeah well sucks to suck cocky as hell he uh, counted his chickens before they hatch the last scene was also baller after he gets beaten up and he gets back up and starts walking back towards the main doors to get back to work that was sick it takes them a while but at least they come around eventually (laughs) i thought the moment of resistance was going to happen maybe a couple kicks to terry's gut earlier but at the end of the day it does build a lot of suspense at that point you're at the tv going fucking do something you pieces of shit you complacent bastards your boy is on the ground yeah fighting for you and you're sitting there sucking the pit of satan doing dick all it's like a christ story right and i think uh the the priest said it the best every time you see this it's a crucifixion it's a crucifixion when they kill when they throw joey off the building it's a crucifixion when they decide who gets a job and who doesn't and terry's story of his crucifixion of getting the shit kicked out of him and left for dead and then getting back up to save everybody and walk in and go to work is terry jesus in this story kind of a little bit yeah he uh bears the weight of everyone's sins their silence 
sentence is put upon him. And then they turn against him when he does the right thing, just like Judas. Oh my God, it's just the Bible. They tricked me into watching the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second, do you not like Judas? Judas is a traitor. I don't like any traitors. We don't like rats, Chris, unless they're confessing to a murder. Jordan, what was that stupid thing you said at work one time? <laughs> stitches get snitches? Snitches get stitches and wind up in ditches. Yeah, but I said it all backwards. Oh, Shout out you? to episode two where we talked about Reservoir Dogs and I called you all a fucking rat. <laughs> <laughs> Music time? Music time. Film score was done by uh, Leonard Bernstein, who has done other notable films like West Side Story. I've never seen this before, but this soundtrack was only about 20 minutes long. So doing a re-listen, much easier than Lord of the Rings. But uh, I thought the music was good, and it's got some high-octane pieces that really do add to uh, the excitement of some scenes. I will say the audio recording, it's a little bit scuffed. It's a little bit, meh. Recording technology has come a long way, but I did think it did what it needed to. It didn't go above and beyond but I, again, it complimented it. It wasn't a standout soundtrack. Or one audio choice that the director went through that I thought was very strange was when Terry confesses to Edie and they choose to amp up a ton of the background noise so you can't hear what's being said. And I get they're doing this to condense the scene because what Terry is explaining, we already understand as an audience, but it only happened kind of like that one time in the film and it kind of comes out of nowhere. I thought it was a little bit jarring. I kind of liked it. I thought it, it was a good way to, I guess, take us out of the conversation and, and just communicate via emotion. And you see him talking and her reaction. I thought it was, I thought it was a good cinematic decision. I, I do like that theatrical device. The reason why I think it feels jarring is because it feels like a little bit of a cop-out. This is a really big moment in the film and seeing Edie's reaction or maybe hearing what Edie has to say might have been a really interesting point in the film where you could have done something creative or interesting, but instead you just get her facial reaction. That would be my only criticism. Actions speak louder than words, Jordan. You guys want to rank this bad boy? Yeah, sure. Definitely. All right. If you're following along with the YouTube video, you can check out a list at the top of the descriptions of all of our rankings so far. But Sarah, where are you going to put On the Waterfront amongst the films we've seen so far? I am putting it in my second spot below Memento and above Return of the King. How about you, Chris? I'm putting it also in a second spot. <laughs> second last? <laughs> oh, a second spot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was like, what? It's in, in my second to last. I don't understand how that can possibly be true. Chris, I don't think we even got to this. Why is this film so bad? What do you hate so much? I just fucking hated every second of it. No, but why? What, 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 what wasn't it doing? I don't know. I just didn't like any of it. Your job as a film critic is to explain why you didn't like it and just saying because it was fucking dumb. He sensed it was anti-communist. That's right. I could just feel it in in the, the communist force. No, I just, I found it like boring. I hated the acting. The whole arc of all the characters was like, bleh. No, nothing surprised me in it. I didn't learn anything from it. There was a couple good scenes in it, but not enough to pull it up. So, Seventh Samurai was at least, I learned some things from. Like it was, I got some insight into the culture that time and it was just not for me you didn't learn anything about yourself you didn't question what you would do if you were in a situation like terry no internal reflection to me it was very cut and dry whether it's what i would actually do in real life they weren't challenging decisions for me i don't even know what to say to that chris that's a, that's unbelievable i it's like so wrong i know that i don't have covid because i just got a negative test and you're the one with no taste it's ridiculous how you're so far away from reality on this film i, I just don't didn't even know like what to it. say to you I, i'm sorry sometimes like there's so little not to like in this film that i feel like at worst it has to be a single digit like okay so where did you put braveheart a couple above this i just put this one at okay so i, I think i'm noticing a pattern here what's that bad love story bad movie is, am i that simplistic is he just a hopeless romantic is that did we crack the case no wonder he simps for shelly so hard he just wants a romance i gotta tell you i think my theory is incorrect because he's got beauty and the beast like down in the bottom third and that's an excellent romance story okay craig hasn't cracked it but i have he just throws okay. a dart at a dartboard and that's how the list no is i literally go through <laughs> so the only movie that I wanted to be over more was Deer Hunter. You watched 14 hours of Amadeus and you thought this <laughs> one was too long? No, the length doesn't have anything to do with it. Like, I don't well, know how... that's the first time I've heard that. Yeah, it's all about the width of the movie. It's the movie's girth that really... 
<laughs> really does it. This was a spaghetti string. I want to. I want them to re-release this movie <laughs> with that quote on the back. It's just a floppy noodle. <laughs> it has no emotional girth. <laughs> no, I'm. I'm sorry. Like just like absolutely nothing of it spoke to me. I. I don't like that style of acting. I didn't think that this movie was going to move at all until we got to Star Wars, but I'm slapping this film right up top number one. I, I think it's better than Memento. What the actual fuck? This movie asks more interesting ethical questions than Memento did. And the big thing for me, I think, was I was totally on board with all of Terry's decisions until they killed his brother. And then I was like, these fuckers are, I, I will burn their house to the ground <laughs> now. And that's what Terry did. It was poised to cost him everything to do that and he did it and i was totally on board with it so number one this so far is the best movie on the list in my opinion terry ain't no bitch man you know what i actually had this film ranked a little bit lower but after talking about some of the symbolism and some of the performances i'm gonna boost it up a couple spots i'm gonna slap this film in number three right below memento and right above inception this film is great. Two scenes that I think are some of the best scenes I've seen in cinema in one movie. That's number three. It doesn't have elves. I'm sorry. It doesn't have a crazy bonkers twist ending. I'm sorry. But number three, that's pretty good. That's respectable, Jordan. Chris, what are we going to be watching in episode 22 of Popcorn Peeps? Three of us will watch a good movie and Chris will watch whatever happens to show up on his dartboard. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? I just didn't like it. I'm sorry. The next movie we'll be watching is Wally. Surprise, surprise, you can watch that on Disney Plus. Or you can pay for it a whole bunch of places. If you have Disney Plus, it is actually in 4K, though. That's kind of cool. I would like to extend a special thank you to our supporters on Patreon.com. If you would like to support our show, there is a link at the top of the description of the YouTube video. But special thank you to Sarah Renier, Frank Costa, Ryan Saarinen, Jim Wamsley, and Travis Laporte. Until next time, thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. I hope I'm on the next one.